researcher wants to know if statisticians in the private sector are better paid than statisticians in the public sector. She selects random samples from both areas. The results are summarized below. Form a 95% confidence interval. So there's our key phrase right there. It says, form a 95% confidence interval. So we know at that point we're working with a confidence interval. It says for the average difference between the salaries. So you want to know the difference between the salaries of government statisticians and private sector statisticians. And we have this ever important bit of knowledge here. It says do not assume equal variances. So we don't want to assume equal variances. So in this problem, we have to work with a very special uh, formula to help us calculate the degrees of freedom for the problem. All right, so let's look at the data. Um, the reason why I mentioned we need degrees of freedom here is the sample sizes are small. N is 26, N is 28. We have a next bar of 35.5, uh, 54.6, 4.16 for the standard deviation, 4.4 for the private sector standard deviation. Okay, so let's take that information and use it to start creating the confidence interval. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to just uh, move this data over. We don't need the wording of the problem anymore because we know we're working with a 95% confidence interval. So I'll just put that over here. Let's go ahead and work out the steps to the problem. The first step, of course, is to record the data. Well, that step is pretty much already done for us here, right? We have the um, information for the two groups laid out nicely. What I do want to do is just write down the fact that the confidence level is 95%. So we're going to say that uh, the confidence level here is 0.95. That means that alpha is, of course, 5% or 0.05. Okay. Now after that, the next step of the problem is going to be to um, get a table value. So our table value for this problem is going to be a T value because both sample sizes are small. So we're going to have a T alpha divided by 2 value. Now, in our case, when we have a T value like this, the um, alpha value is going to be obviously 0.05, and so of course we'll be looking, since it's going to be in two tails, 0 0.025, that's half of alpha, right? So we look up 0 0.025, but the degrees of freedom are the question mark. What degrees of freedom will we use? Well, it turns out for this problem, the degrees of freedom aren't as simple as they were before. It's not just n1 plus n2 minus 2. That's not the formula we're going to have to use. So here's what we're going to use whenever we have um, sample sizes that are not equal. So when the first sample size for this group is not equal to that group, um, at that point we'll use the following formula for degrees of freedom. So I wrote this down for us so we have it ready. So that's the formula we're going to have to use for degrees of freedom. It's quite complicated. Um, it's called the welch sadler weight method. It's an approximation method to estimate the degrees of freedom. So at this point um, what we're going to do is to calculate this complicated fraction and then from there when we're done we're going to truncate the answer. When we say truncate it just means round down so in other words just drop the decimal point off the answer. Alright so whenever the sample sizes are unequal like this we'll use that formula. If the sample sizes are equal you'll just use the traditional n1 plus n2 minus 2 or in other words uh, the sum of the two degrees of freedom n1 minus 1 plus n2 minus 1. So that's the traditional a formula for degrees of freedom. We can use that if they're the same, but if they're not the same, if it's n1 not equal to n2, then we have to use this formula. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate that formula for this problem here. So we're going to take the information um, in our problem and use this formula with it. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. We'll start with the a value and the b value. So the a value here for the first R is going to be 4.16 squared divided by n, which is 26. And then for the b value, we're going to end up with the 4.4 squared divided by 28. And when we do that, we'll have our two points. Okay, so I'm going to use our calculator to calculate that. And what I'd like to do here is to store these values in variables. You can just write them down if you don't have a store feature on your calculator, but I prefer to store them in mind. So I'm going to do 4.16 squared divided by 26, right? And then what I'm going to do here is I can hit enter and get the answer if I want. It's a very simple number to write down, but I actually have a button down here that says stow. And that means I can store that anywhere I want. I'm going to store it in A. So I actually have it in the variable A for later. And then I'll do the same for B, 4.4 squared divided by 28. When I hit enter, I'll get my answer. And again, I hit store alpha b, store it in the answer spot b. So now I have that saved in my calculator. Okay, that'll make my work a little easier for the rest of the fraction. Now, 
for the rest of the fraction, what I have to do is to actually plug in all the answers here that I found. Let me just write these answers down so we have them for later. It's uh, 0.6656, and for this one, it's uh, 0.6914, dot, 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 goes on and on and on. All right, now let's fill in the fraction. So we're going to have A, which will be 0.6656, plus B, which is 0.6914, dot, 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 all that squared. Then we're going to divide that part by the A value, 0.6656, divided by 1 minus the sample size, so actually we have to square this value, then 1 minus the sample size, which is going to be 25, plus the B value, which is 0 0.6914, dot, 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 right, squared, divided by 27. Okay, so you should use as many places here as you can. Don't round. If you round too soon, you'll end up having a pretty big error overall. So try to use as many places as you can. You don't have to use all the digits, but you know, use maybe five or six digits. That way you're sure not to have any error introduced by that early rounding. Okay, so let's work this out, see what this comes out to be. Now, my calculator, of course, I have it stored there, so the A and B can just be used directly. So I'm literally going to say A divided by or sorry, A plus, forgive me, alpha B squared. So I'm doing A plus B squared. Then I'm going to divide that whole piece by the denominator. Now the denominator is A squared divided by 25 plus B squared divided by 27. Close that parenthesis up and then hit enter. And we're done, get 51.9803, etc. right? So let's call it just 51.98. And then remember, we're going to truncate it. So we're literally going to drop that off and just say that the answer for us is 51. And that's our solution. OK, so now that we have the answer for the degrees of freedom for t, we can say, OK, we can go to our table now, finally, and look up the t value, assuming the degrees of freedom is 51. So the difficult part about this uh, method is that the degrees of freedom is complicated to calculate. But once you have it, once it's calculated, um, then the rest of it is pretty much the same as before. Okay, so we're looking for the area 0 0.025 in one tail with 51 degrees of freedom. So let's try to find that here at the bottom of the table. Okay, so we're somewhere between these two values, 50 and 55. And our choice is going to be use 50 because that critical value is larger than the critical value at 55. So we're going to use 2.009 as our critical value. Okay, so we found the answer for t to be 2.009. Okay, so now that we have our table value, the rest of the steps are just formulas, right? So step three is going to be to get the margin of error. Okay, so the margin of error is going to be the t alpha divided by two value. And then we actually have kind of the formula we used almost for when we had large sample size. So we have the sample size for, or sorry, the standard deviation for the first population squared divided by n1 plus the sample standard deviation for the second population squared divided by n2. So it's very similar to the formula we had when we dealt with just the large sample case. Okay, so let's plug in the t value. So we have 2.009 times the square root of the s value, which in this case is 4.16. We're going to square that, divided by the sample size, which is 26, plus 4.4 .4 squared, divided by its sample size of 28. Okay, let's plug that in our calculator and see what we get. Okay, so we're going to have 2.009 times the square root of 4.16 squared divided by 26 plus 4.4 .4 squared divided by 28. Close that up, hit enter, and we end up with 2.34. So approximately 2.340, let's say. Okay, so with, from there, what I'm going to do is I'll store that in my calculator as a variable, x, and I'll come back and use the full thing and round only at the end of the problem. That's what you should do. You shouldn't really round to the very end. Now, of course, that's impractical if you don't have a store feature on your calculator, so you'll have to round a little bit, but don't round too far, right? Keep as many digits as you can. 
All right, now from there, the last step is to fill in the classic confidence interval formula. Here, x bar 1 minus x bar 2 minus the error. And then do the same thing on the other side, but add the error. So x bar 1 minus x bar 2 plus the error. All right, and then let's fill that in and see what we get. What are the differences between the sample means? If we subtract these, what do we get? Let's do that quickly here. So we're going to have 35.5 minus 54.6. And when we're done, we get the answer at negative 19.1. So we'll say negative 19.1 minus the error 2.340 dot 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 and negative 19.1 plus the error of 2.340 dot dot dot. Okay, so let's see what that gives us now. We have minus 19.1 minus the error. Now, I have that stored, so I'm just going to do it that way. We get the answer minus 21.4. Four, let's do it to two decimal places since these are dollar amounts. And then we'll have the next one go to we add the error in here, we'll end up with negative 16.76. Okay, so it's negative $21.44 to negative $16.76. So remember, of course, their wording here is going to be that we're 95% confident, right? So we are 95% confident that the true mean difference is between negative $21.44 and negative $16.76. So essentially what this is saying, since we did the subtraction government minus private, and the differences both turned out to be negative. Since the subtraction was done this way, it shows us that basically the government employees make less than the private employees because the private dollar amounts were bigger. And that means when we subtracted them, we ended up with a negative result. Even considering the margin of error, we still ended up with an interval that was fully negative. That means that the true mean difference, we believe, is somewhere between these two numbers. So with the minimum scenario, they make $16 more an hour or $17 more an hour or so. And the worst case scenario here, they would make as much as uh, like twenty-one and a half dollars or so more per hour. So essentially, what you're saying here is that the um, you know the private sector pays better than the government sector. But you know, of course, we know that there are advantages to being in the government sector and more job security, better pensions, and benefits usually. So um, there's a trade-off there. But um, the question is, is the trade-off worth this big difference in salaries? And that's always the issue there. The a prospective employee you know, has to consider before taking a job in either of those areas, right? Um, the private sector usually asks more of you, but they pay you uh, much better than the government sector usually does.